Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. I'm sitting here in the Center for the Advanced Study and Practice of Hope, which is the home of Kids at Hope these days here at Arizona State University. And I would like to welcome you to our discussion uh, webinar this afternoon around culture and bureaucracy and how the two work together or not uh, to accomplish the goals of an organization. So it's all about how do we navigate a culture of hope within your bureaucracy. This is the second in a series of webinars that Kids at Hope is producing. Uh, the third will be in January, and it will be uh, Kenna Ho, our own Kenna Ho, uh, presenting for that one. Um, I'm not going to go over research conclusions. Rick covered that very nicely uh, last month. If you didn't get a chance to see it, there is a link on the website you can go to and, and see that one. Today, we're all about culture and bureaucracy. So um, I want to start with this quote. I'll give you a second to read it. I love this quote because um, it points out that our belief in children and that children are our future uh, predates all of us that are sitting here uh, engaged in this. And in fact, uh, it's unique to no special group. Uh, Lakota was a, a, a sitting bull was the Lakota chief, uh, and he said this 150 years ago. So um, this is not a new concept, what we are talking about. It predates all of us. Um, so let's talk about, and, and many of you will recognize the picture here from the uh, module one workbook where we talk about bureaucracy and culture and bureaucratic titles versus cultural titles. Um, and so I'm just gonna skim over this briefly to remind you what it was about. And then we'll kind of get into the meat, uh, a little bit more depth around bureaucracy and culture. So we use the sailboat here as an analogy to represent both the bureaucratic side of an organization and the cultural side of an organization. And, and we like this um, metaphor, if you will, because the wind represents what we would call the bureaucratic piece, the paperwork, the checklists, all of the red tape uh, that is involved in, in being part of an organization. And uh, the wind is a great metaphor for that because we know that we can actually see the effects of the wind, we can measure it, we, um, we are aware of it on our faces and around us, whether we're sitting on that boat as part of the organization or whether we're sitting on the shore looking on. Um, culture, on the other hand, is more like the current that's under the water. Sitting on the shore watching a boat go across the water, we may not even be aware that there is a current. It may not be obvious at all. The boat may be doing strange and unusual things, but you wouldn't know it was the current playing with them unless you were actually sitting on the boat. Well, culture often does strange and unusual things to an organization also. And unless you're part of that organization, you may not be aware that it's actually the culture that's getting in the way of forward progress and not some rule or regulation. Um, current is really hard to detect in the water. Uh, for those friends who are in the Pacific Northwest, if you've ever been on Route 20 between Anacors, Washington and uh, Coopville um, on Whidbey Island, uh, as you go across Deception Pass, if you slow down and look down, you can actually see current. It's one of the few times in my life I've ever been able to actually see current in the ocean. Um, and, and that current is so strong that you'll see boats waiting for the current to die, for the tide to go slack before they even try to go through the pass because the current is so strong. Culture can affect an organization in the same kind of powerful ways. So let's take a look at each of both bureaucracy and culture, each of these concepts a little deeper and see um, if we can understand them a little bit better. So bureaucracy is all about the things that we do. It represents the task dimension of the work that we do. And often 
um, bureaucratic uh, uh, bureaucracy is represented by goals, strategic plans, um, uh, lesson plans if you're an educator, all of those things that we write down and, and create this uh, aspiration for in the future and, and we're going to measure it and we're going to figure out how much progress we're making towards those specific things. Bureaucracy represents the mission of the organization. Why does this organization exist? And, uh, and, then, and then we create goals and strategic plans around that. So what we know about bureaucracy is that it's all about numbers. We can measure it. And, and we know that if it doesn't get measured, it doesn't get done. So we spend a lot of time measuring things in our, in our various uh, organizations and communities. We use rubrics. We use checklists. We use assessments. We use um, audits. Uh, and what you won't find much of in the Kids at Hope cultural framework is bureaucratic pieces. But I want to touch on two. We do have two that we uh, advocate for. One of them you may be familiar with is the concept of TENS. We ask as people start with us in, in, in this path toward being treasure hunters and hopeologists, we ask people to rate themselves on a scale of one to 10, uh, how strong is your belief that all kids can succeed, no exceptions. And, uh, and of course, 10 being the, the best score, I'm all in, and, and anything less than that is less than that. This is one bureaucratic measure, one of only two in Kids at Hope that we use. And it's an indicator for us of where our staff is or where our employees or where our community is in terms of our belief and how much more education or um, uh, modeling and coaching do we need to do to get people to be a 10. The other bureaucratic piece is something we call ACES tracking. And in this, with this particular tool, um, we ask an agency or an organization or a school to list all of the kids that they deal with. And then they invite the adults who work with those kids to identify those kids for whom they may be an ACE. So I might say for three people on this list, I'm an ace of clubs for this one, this one, and that one. I may be an ace of diamonds for three other kids. My own kids go to that school. Guess what? I'm the ace of hearts for them. So, um, and the purpose of ACEs tracking is not to uh, meet some goal of, you know, every kid in the school has seven aces and that's our goal and we have to meet that goal. That's not the point. Um, the point is that we want to be sure that every kid in the school, every kid in the organization, every young person that we deal with is connected in some meaningful and sustainable way with a caring adult. That's the only purpose between the, behind the ACEs tracking. So those are the two bureaucratic pieces that you will encounter with Kids at Hope. Bureaucracy is unique to every organization, depending on what, your, what the mission of the organization is. You're going to measure things differently. You're going you're to pick different numbers. You're going to have different criteria and so forth. And so um, given that we deal with many agencies that deal with children in many different ways, we don't have a lot to talk about in terms of the bureaucratic piece that you deal with every day because that's unique to your own organization. What we are gonna spend the rest of our time um, this afternoon talking about is the cultural aspect of, of work. And so I wanna start with this uh, quote from Edgar Schein, who is sort of one of the gurus of organizational culture. Take a minute and read this. So I think uh, what we want to focus on is the idea that leaders create and manage culture. And I want to disabuse you of the notion that uh, in order to be a leader, you have to have some sort of bureaucratic title. Because we know that there are any 
number of people in our organizations who lead by example. They lead from the middle of the pack. We follow them because they come up with reasons that are legitimate and rational, and, and they, they lead through persuasion, not through any sort of um, titular power that they may have. So as we read through this and, and look at what does it take to be a leader versus a manager or administrator, uh, managers and administrators are typically a bureaucratic title. Leaders can be anyone in the organization. And the other thing I want to point out about this is that as a leader, um, whether you are the head of the organization or you're leading from the middle of the pack, um, the, the power that you have is dependent on your ability to communicate, listen. Communication is a two-way street. So it's both sharing and listening and that really good leaders have this ability to, to stay in touch with the people that they work with and know what's important to them um, going forward into any situation. One of the things we know about uh, culture is that it is kind of the way we do things around here. Culture represents the why and the how of the work that we do. So bureaucracy, bureaucracy represents the what and the who. Culture represents the why and the how. So culture is how we do things around here or the way we work with and treat one another. One of the... Um, indicators of culture, one of the tools that we can use to help reinforce culture is the use of symbols. Symbols keep spirit and goals alive. So if you look at the examples on the screen of symbols, each of them with few or no words have a unique meaning. Um, and they may mean different things in different places, but it, it, um, different parts of the world um, there may be one there that some of you aren't as familiar with, um, but trust me that in, in Uganda, uh, that flag in the lower left corner is very symbolic to them. And as I understand it, we may have some people logging in from Uganda this afternoon. Um, so each of these symbols represents something and, and we get a feeling from it. We know what they mean. We don't have to necessarily use the words around them if we just uh, you know use a peace sign whether it's the the peace sign that you see on the screen or the you know the two fingers that we hold up everybody kind of knows what that means without us having to use a lot of words or or um, language to explain it so that's inherent in culture is that cultures start to create symbols that help keep the spirit and the goals alive. That's why we have a, a logo with Kids at Hope. And that's why if you've ever done a, a module one with Rick Miller, he does a fabulous job of explaining why we use the logo we use and the, and the symbolism behind each of the components of our Kids at Hope logo. If you look at the Kids at Hope logo at the, at the time traveler at the bottom of the screen, Again, there's all kinds of symbolic stuff there. The gas tank being the brain and, and the um, four destinations on the, on the backrest in the back and looking out the headlight shining out into the future. All of those things are symbolic of what we are about here at Kids at Hope. Um, one of the things that our friend uh, uh, Anthony Muhammad, who presented it, at our master's institute a couple of years ago, one of the things he shared with us at the time is that culture itself can't be measured or quantified because it's not about goals, it's not about numbers, it's about feelings, it's about impressions, it's about the way things are done, not that they are done. And so if you want to assess culture, the only way to do that is by using indicators. So we can measure other things that might help us understand the picture of the culture, but there's no real direct way to measure what a culture looks like. So let's see if we can understand culture a little bit better, and then we can look at 
what are some indicators then that would help us to see are we where we want to be or are we heading in the right direction or have we got some work to do? So one of the first things that uh, we know about culture, is, and there are four sort of major areas that we're going to touch on uh, around culture. The first has to do with culture is embedded in the beliefs and the values that people bring with them to the organization. And then the norms that are created around those beliefs and values that people behave within in the organization. So as we, as we talk about each one of these, um, beliefs can be very personal, but they can also be organizational. So we, of course, would advocate that, that you do everything you can to encourage the people who work with you and the people that you hire or bring in, that you encourage them in their belief that all children, no exceptions, are, are capable of success. Um, it doesn't really matter which comes first. And there's I've heard many arguments uh, in my 25 years as an organizational development consultant who specialized in uh, organizational culture. Um, I've heard many different people advocate that beliefs come before values. I've heard just as many advocate that values come before beliefs. Doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, they both are important that we understand what they are. It's like the chicken and the egg, doesn't matter which came first, we have them both. And they tend to work together. <clears throat> if you've ever worked in an organization where you, you did your research ahead of time and you found out what the guiding principles or the values or the interests or whatever of the organization were and you came to work based on what was listed on their website, and you just feel like a fish out of water, like, I don't, I don't quite feel like I fit in here. It may be that while they know that that's something they should value, that they don't actually uh, walk the talk when it comes down to it. And so that may be a disconnect that, that some organizations have, that, that they know they should value something, but they haven't really figured out how to operationalize that. Um, Examples of values, for instance, uh, we often talk about safety as an, a value that that organizations pay attention to when they're when they're a kids at hope culture. Uh, but we break down that safety value into there are really three different areas. So safety in and of, of itself may may cause you to think about one thing. And usually that one thing, the first thing that pops into people's heads has to do with physical safety, um, you know, crossing guards or, or um, um, security gates as people come and go are there to try to create a physical safety for the people who enter that, that workspace. Um, but there are two other kinds of safety that we also want to keep in mind when we're talking about culture. And one has to do with emotional safety. Are we treating each other in a way that allows people to express their emotion in appropriate ways without being ostracized or put down in some fashion? And the, and the, and the third piece has to do with intellectual safety. What are we as adults doing with a kid who doesn't fall within the the sort of norms or parameters of intellectual safety. So this kid is way ahead or this kid is, is not at the, at the grade level or the level where they should be. Are we still making it safe for them to intellectually be where they are? Um, we wanna pay attention to those things. Those are examples of safety that, um, that we have to keep in mind as a Kids at Hope culture. So. The norms then, we take those beliefs and those values and we start to operationalize those in specific behaviors that we engage in. Um, and, and one of the things we want to pay attention to is, do our norms then reinforce the values and the beliefs that we say we have? Do we say we uh, value safety, but we, we mock somebody who has an answer that is uh, not typical? Um, because then it's not safe and we've just violated one of our values. So 
We want to be sure that our protocols, our behaviors um, align with the things that we value. What are we unconsciously practicing? Um, one of the things that, uh, that we have to be aware of is assumptions that we may have. Assumptions are, are deeply embedded in cultural tapestries. They, sh they shape our thoughts and our actions in very powerful ways. Um, and we're often unaware of the assumptions that are underlying whatever our actions are. These assumptions, these fundamental assumptions, they grow out of our beliefs and our values. Um, but we may not even be aware that we're still that, that that assumption is there. It's it's dropped out of our awareness, but it hasn't dropped out of our practice. A wonderful example of this is, uh, on a lighter note, is uh, uh, the story of the young the young newlywed who's making her first Easter ham, and she uh, proceeds to get the knife out and she she starts to cut the end off the ham, the ends off of either end of the ham, and. And her spouse says to her, what are you, what are you doing? Why, what, what does that do? How does, I've never made a ham. How does that, what is that doing for the ham? And, and the young bride says, well, I don't really know. I just know that's always the way my mom made it. My dad made it. She says, let's, let's call dad. We'll find out why. So they called dad. Dad says, I don't really know why that was just always the way grandma made it. So that's the way I always made it. I never thought to ask why, mm, the sign of an assumption. I never thought to ask why. And, uh, and so they call grandma. They said, grandma, what does it do that you, why do you cut the ends off the ham whenever you make a baked ham? Um, Cause I'm making one and I started to do that, but we just aren't sure what that does for the ham. Well, grandma started to laugh and said, I can't believe you all are still doing that. That was the only way I could ever get my ham to fit in the oven. So what are the assumptions that we are still living with today that may or may not still be reinforcing values or beliefs that, that are what we want to be valuing and believing still? Um, what are you enabling with your norms? One of the one of the challenges I think as an organization is when you look at the and, and I'm going to transition into the next section, which is um, rituals and coaching and modeling. Those those are also components of culture. What are some of the rituals or the um, celebrations, if you will, that that you engage in on a regular basis, um, and are those going back to those values, beliefs, and norms that, that we have identified. Um, so one of the things, and we've had discussions here about things like awards for kids. And are we, are we singling out a kid out of the bunch? Is there really only one kid who deserves the award? Or are there multiple kids who deserve an award? And if there are multiple kids who deserve the award and all kids are capable of success, no exceptions, then should we be giving awards to all the kids who are eligible? Um, just one sort of, you know, as we idea about the things we ponder and consider here. Um, so what are you coaching? How are you modeling the beliefs and the values that you have in your organization? Are you holding others accountable for behaving according to the norms? Are you holding others accountable to uphold the beliefs and the values? Um, and it comes, so Chris, um, and I'm gonna butcher the last name here, Bohalian quoted, life is filled with small moments that seem prosaic until one has the distance to look back and see the chain of large moments they unleashed. I love this because this, this quote, because it talks about the small moments. It isn't always about the big events. In fact, most of our culture is defined by what happens in those small moments, not in the crises or the big events or the big, huge celebra celebrations. The culture of an organization is defined by what happens in those day-to-day -day small moments where you're interacting with young people. Don't wait for the large moments. Use the small 
moments to your advantage. The rituals, the celebrations, the modeling, what we say is important. Values are manifested in our behaviors. Values that we claim, values we claim may not be manifested. If we claim that we value something, but there's no evidence in our behavior that we do, do we really value it? Take a look at the things that your organization says they value, and then look around and evaluate. Are we really modeling that? Do the behaviors match that? Um, some manifestations, uh, examples of manifestations would be the way, the way we greet each other. Uh, when we see each other in the morning or throughout the day, what rules are reinforced in our organization and how? How do we reinforce those rules as they are followed or not? And then who does get recognized for praise and who doesn't get? I have two daughters and they're going to have to forgive me for sharing this story about them. But um, my older daughter was a typical first child, followed all the rules, everything, you know, she did everything the right way the first time and, and didn't push too much those boundaries. Um, my younger daughter, on the other hand, uh, liked to push the boundaries, liked to figure, well, you know, they would bring grade cards home from school. And the older one, her grade card on the, not the grade side of the grade card, but the other side, the checks were always in the right boxes. She was always meeting or exceeding the expectations around behavior and so forth. And um, and the younger, yeah, you know, sometimes they check the, you know, she's chatting a little too much with her friends or she's not focused on her work or, you know, those kinds of things that, that happen to all kids. But what I found fascinating about uh, the rituals of the school um, was that, they had a student of the month program, and maybe you do too. The student of the month never was awarded to my older daughter. She followed all the rules all the time. The younger daughter got student of the month on a couple of occasions because there was such a dramatic difference in her behavior. My challenge to you is why would you not recognize the kid who was doing it right all along. Are there kids who aren't being recognized by your rewards or your recognitions who deserve to be recognized, but because they're quiet and they follow the rules all the time, we feel like we don't have to reward them. We don't have to recognize them. But if we believe in all children, no exceptions, we should be recognizing every kid who meets our expectations, not just the ones who did it for the first time. I'll get off my soapbox about that. Um, so are the small moments of believing, connecting, and time traveling being recognized in your organization among the adults? Because if the adults aren't recognizing it and rewarding it, you can bet the kids aren't seeing it as much as they need to. So what formal rewards and recognitions are being given? Do these honor our, all our belief in all children, no exception? Um, and do we recognize those who connect with kids in small moments as well as those large moments? Are you modeling hope? We all know that you can't have hope and you can't teach hope unless you have hope. Are you modeling hope for kids? Because if they don't see you doing it, you can teach it till the cows come home, but they aren't gonna believe it. You have to be doing it yourself. And are you coaching others in the, culture and the vocabulary of hope. Coaching is dicey because many times this is with your peers, your colleagues. It's not necessarily with the kids. And so um, this is, but this is where that cultural accountability lies. It's not, we can't hold people accountable through evaluations, but we can hold people accountable through coaching. And it's as simple as uh, anything else that you would coach someone on. Um, somebody new comes into the organization and, and is using a, a phrase or a, a word that within your own organization is a hot button word for some reason, somewhere back in time. Uh, 
that word got a or that phrase got a negative connotation. And so uh, somebody leans over and says, "We don't use that phrase here. That's not." That's not how we say things or that's not how we do things around here. That's coaching. And you can do the same thing around kids at Hope. When when adults start talking about uh, a kid in their class and and if they go down the dream stealing villain sort of path, um, do we encourage them back to the treasure hunter path of, you know, we don't we'll, we let you vent a little bit, but then we want you to get back on board the, okay, now talk about their treasures. What do you like about the kid? What does the kid have going for him? What are you finding out that surprised you and delighted you about this young person? Um, who do you hold up? Um, well, let me talk about mental models just for a second. Mental models are <clears throat> images, assumptions, and stories that we carry in our minds of ourselves, of other people, of institutions, of every aspect of the world. Mental models also shape how we act, but because they're tacit, existing below the level of awareness, they are often untested and unexamined. So let's make ours explicit. We talk about a mental model, and, and I'm gonna come back to this, but, but we have a mental model that we use um, in Kids at Hope that reminds us what it is that's important and, and uh, what aspects we need to pay attention to around kids. That's one of the ways we can make things explicit. Another component of culture has to do with heroes, stories, myths, and villains. So the first question, heroes, who do we hold up as the heroes or people who are worthy models for kids? Um, are we in fact creating a hero out of somebody that's really not particularly heroic? Are they a hero because they they epitomize a kids at hope culture, or are they a hero because they won a basketball game, or they um, there was one large moment in which they did something phenomenal? But on a daily basis, they really aren't a treasure hunter. If we're making them heroes because of one event, we might want to re-examine that. Uh, one event does should not a hero by itself make. It should be a progression of all kinds of behaviors that lead up to one large event. But, but boy, if the behaviors that came before aren't heroic, let's be careful about making them a hero. Uh, myths. <clears throat> myths are typically a fundamental uh, assumption that we've made. And, and we want to challenge them. We want to make sure that the myths that are told, myths are a type of story, uh, actually reinforce our values and our beliefs. And the stories, the same way, are the stories that we tell when new people come on board or, or uh, as we're recruiting people to, to come to work here or to use our services, are the stories we tell actually reinforcing these beliefs and values that we hold? And then who are the dream stealing villains in our organization? And do we call them out? Because we shouldn't just sit idly by and watch somebody steal a kid's dreams. And last but not least, part of our <clears throat> um, organizational culture is made up of networks, cabals, and teams. Uh, networks being sort of who talks to who, how do things get done, what's the protocol for, you know, if I really want it to happen, do I see this person or that person? Do I talk to the one in charge or the one who knows what's going on? Um, all of those are, are network kinds of questions. And cabals are uh, groups of people that band together around perhaps single issues. Um, so, you know, they may hate the new uh, protocol that's come down the pike and, and they, they form this sort of little click almost that's sole purpose is to prove that this new initiative is bad. That's what a cabal would be. 
And then there are teams, those times when individuals come together to work for the greater good towards some common purpose for the greater good. And it's all hands on deck and everybody's on the same page about the task that needs to be done. Then the only question becomes, how do we as a team work together to get that uh, task accomplished? Um, and, and teams often are formed around and, and become stronger than the task that they are uh, created to accomplish. So we started off as a work team, but we've become so much more than that. We've got each other's backs. We make sure that, you know, if somebody's out for the day, we've got it covered. If, if there's trouble brewing, we're, we're, we've got their back, you know, we've got their six all the time, all of those things to find teams. So, so as we, as we look at this weird sort of, um, organic structure here that is an organizational culture, all of these pieces come together uh, to create this. They're very organic in nature. They're very unstructured typically. Um, but what we need to know about culture is that cultural patterns are highly enduring. Um, they often exist long beyond the organization or the people in the organization who created the culture in the first place. Uh, and, and, you know, we only have to look at sort of the geopolitical uh, conflicts in the world today. And we can see that, that these conflicts and uh, predate anybody who's living today. They go back hundreds of years, but the, but the cultural pattern is so enduring that it's really hard to find ways out of those old conflicts. So cultural patterns are highly enduring. They have a powerful impact on performance and they shape the way people think, act, and feel. So let's come back to Kids at Hope and talk about the cultural patterns uh, of Kids at Hope. When we talk about how it shapes the way uh, kids think, act, and feel, when we talk about the um, enduring nature of it, oops, sorry, I went ahead of myself here. Um, part of this enduring nature of culture is apparent in our universal truths. We have three of them. Children succeed when they are, we know there are three of them, when they're surrounded by adults who believe they can succeed, they succeed when they have meaningful, sustainable relationships with caring adults, and we know they can succeed when they can articulate their own future and in four destinations. So those are, the, those are the things that we know endure, those three research findings. The impact on performance, we know that if kids have more ACEs, they have a greater chance of success. It improves their odds tremendously. With no ACEs, it, they're virtually guaranteed. They, they're gonna struggle their whole lives. They are gonna be the ones who fall through the cracks. Um, and, and with the more ACEs they get, the better their odds of being successful in our own um, Anthony, uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, name went just went right out of my head. Um, but we have examples, you have examples in your own life of, of these kids that we know we have bumped their trajectory to something better because of the connection that we have had with that particular kid. And then um, in the way that, that we at Kids at Hope, you as treasure hunters and hopeologists, the way you think, act, and feel around kids, the things that they think about themselves, the idea that they now have a growth mindset uh, and that we are their treasure hunters and that they actually have skills and talents and goals for the future. All of that is how they think about one another. They act how they act with each other and with others. They connect, they're able to connect in meaningful ways. They learn that through us modeling and connecting with them. And then it shapes the way they feel because we believe in them. We teach them hope. That is also a feeling. It is science, but it's also a feeling. And 
that feeling of being eager and anxious to get on with reaching each of their four destinations, knowing that things are going to change along the way, but I can still, I can still create my own future and it can be a good one that I've designed for myself. So um, I want to ask you, as you ponder in your own organization, what is it that you as leaders are paying attention to? Are you paying attention to kids' treasures or their deficits? Are you paying attention to improvements or failures? Because the treasure hunters are finding the, tre the um, treasures and the improvements. And dream stealing vil villains tend to spend their time looking and focused on deficits and failures as the end and not a, just a, a data point that allows us to know where to start. We have, we have five practices. Uh, here's our mental blueprint. We know that we start with a belief in all children, no exceptions. We connect with our four aces. We time travel to four destinations. That becomes our mental blueprint. We have five practices in, the kids at, in a kids at hope culture. We believe clearly all, our belief is clearly articulated. It's embedded in our rights, our rituals, our communication. That's how we know that it's a kids at hope organization, a kids at hope culture is the belief is clearly articulated. The pledges that we use is another of our practices. Why do we use them? Because it affirms for kids that they have the potential to be something other than what they currently are. And that it's also, by the way, affirming for adults as treasure hunters. We have two pledges that we can say the treasure hunter pledge and know that I have something to offer kids and I'm going to do that and I'm going to share it freely. Report cards. Report cards focus on potential, not behavior. It helps the kids see their talents. It celebrates their successes. Another of our practices is passports. It focuses on the kid's future in four destinations, and it reiterates those connections that they have with other meaningful adults and in ways that they can carry it with them as they go on in life, whether it's back home to mom and dad or wherever life takes them, they, they can keep those as a reminder of their childhood and sort of who was there for me back in the day. And then the last practice is our ACEs tracking, this intentional um, behavior, this intentional mapping of who is connected, which of our kids have meaningful connections, and which of our kids do we need to find a meaningful connection for. We want all kids connected without exceptions. Our cultural framework is as easy as Rick likes to say as one, two, three, four, five, and you'll remember this from our training manual. One being our belief, all kids no exception. Two, we all every adult is a treasure hunter, every kid is a time traveler. Three, our three universal truths and practice. We believe, we connect, we time travel. Four represents the four aces, the four destinations, and the high and the five represents our five practices that we just talked about: the belief, the pledges, the report cards, the passports, and the aces tracking. So that's the cultural framework in one, two, three, four, five. Now, um, I'm sure that there may be some questions out there, and I am ready to take questions if anybody wants to weigh in. All right, Wendy, um, great job. And we do have a question from Kenna, and she's asking, Wendy, what steps would you suggest for an organization that wants to change its culture? Well, the first step is to, to invite others on the journey with you. It's pretty hard to change a culture one person by themselves. And if you've ever seen our um, crazy shirtless guy video, um, you'll see that the first person who tries to, who puts themselves out there to do something different, people are gonna look at that fairly uh, skeptically. 
it's really when you get when you invite others to join you that it becomes a movement. Now you've got some momentum going and then and be specific about uh, and small steps, specific small steps about how you want to change the culture. There's a story in a book, and I think it's from Good to Great, uh, where four young teachers uh, started at a school at the same time. And what they encountered at that particular school was a, was a pretty negative culture. Uh, people didn't speak to each other. They, they groused a lot. They were really negative. And, and lunch times were gripe sessions. And, and these four teachers were pretty disillusioned and, and, but found each other and decided that while they couldn't do anything about anybody else, they could among themselves do something differently to help each other out. And so they started meeting in one of the class, one of their classrooms for lunch and, and they would laugh and they would talk and they would, they would talk about their kids positively. They vowed to greet each other in the hallways and, and, um, and stick their heads in each other's doors as they pass by and just, you know, give a high five or whatever throughout the day. And what was really interesting was that that became the culture that took hold. Other people started to see that and they wanted in on that because it just felt so much better than this negative thing that they had going. So, so if you can recognize some small steps that and some people who will engage in, in a change movement with you, that's a good first step in changing a culture. Be the, be the treasure hunter even when no one else is and invite others to, to um, be a treasure hunter too. I'll give another example, and this is a personal one. It doesn't really have anything to do with kids, but um, I had a group of women friends that we would go away for a weekend periodically and and uh, there's one woman in the group who, who spent a lot of time complaining about her husband. Um, and every time all of us, there were six or seven of us in the group, and every time we get together, she'd complain about her husband. And it got kind of old really quickly. And so we determined, because we were going away for this weekend, that every time that she brought up something negative about her husband, the rest of us would say something positive about our significant others. And which was personally for me, I was going through a divorce at the time. This was not an easy task for me to find something positive to say about a spouse. I'm in the process of divorcing, but I, was really my, I jumped in and, you know, even though it may have only had a minimal effect on her, it had such a great positive effect on the rest of us that we all left that weekend feeling better about spouses and ourselves. So we had an impact on the culture, even though it didn't change one person's behavior. That is great advice, Wendy. Uh, in fact, I could use that on my husband today. <laughs> so <laughs> awesome. And Wendy, we have somebody from Greenland here. His Awesome. Welcome. Yes. And forgive me, Charborn, if that is mispronounced. But your question is, any suggestions, Wendy, for a Western school and curriculum working in a native setting? I, uh, you cut out on part of that, so I missed part of it. Sure. Hey, Any suggestions for a Western school and curriculum working in a native setting? So one of the things that you have to recognize when you come into a place is that the culture of the of the community will help define the culture of the work that you do. So when you, I, I taught in Alaska for a while, so I, and, and dealt with native Alaskan, the native Alaskan culture, and it's very different from Western culture. Um, and so one of the first things we had to do was figure out the values and beliefs of that culture, and then try to figure out how do we appropriately embed their values and their beliefs, blend them with what it is we're trying to accomplish with them without trampling their beliefs and values. So there may be some pieces of your curriculum or your programs that you may have to at least temporarily let go of because they're never going to uh, allow you to change the culture if you don't value what they value. 
if your cultural ideas don't value what they value. I hope that helps. Thank you. And Torborn, um, welcome from Greenland. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Also a shout out to Lynn Rosemary from Canada. And she says, hi, Wendy. And also says, we love the kids at Hope Philosophy. Fabulous. It works anywhere. Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, some folks in Uganda who are practicing Kids at Hope. We have some people in India, Greenland, Canada, all over the United States, 27 states, I think it was at last count. So um, yeah, this is not about Western civilization. It works anywhere. And one other question that we just received, and she asks, would you suggest that organizations formally adopt and post norms? I missed, again, I, I missed part of the question. Can you say it again? Sure, sure no problem, Wendy. Um, would you suggest that organizations formally adopt and post norms? Well, when I, when I worked, when I, when I taught school, because I started teaching way back in the day, teaching school, um, I really only had three uh, ground rules or norms for my classroom. And, and they were pretty generic, but they were applicable in virtually any situation. Um, the challenge in posting norms that, that are for the whole organization is that if, they, if you get too specific, um, they, they tend to start to go by the wayside because we can't adhere to them all the time. They aren't applicable in every situation. So the three I used were that we start and end on time, uh, that we, um, we uh, treat each other with dignity and respect, and um, what was the last one? We don't do we don't do damage to any one or anything. Those were the three, and and they sort of saw me through whatever because I could make the case that uh, you know pretty much any any um, behavior that was off the charts. Um, I could point to one of those and say, hmm, are you treating people with dignity and respect if you're, you know, using sarcasm inappropriately or something like that? So um, I would I would say, yes, generally speaking, norms are a good idea, um, but be careful about being too specific that because then it gives people permission to start ignoring. And once they start ignoring, it's easy to ignore all of them. Awesome. Thank you, Wendy. And then it looks right. like that is a wrap up on the questions. All right. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, we do have some upcoming events. Uh, the next webinar is Wednesday, January 8th at 1.30 Mountain Standard Time. It's Are You a True, True Believer uh, with Kenaho, our own Kenaho. And uh, it's a deep dive into our universal truth number one. We have two mini masters coming up, both um, in March, one in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, and one in Pasco, Washington. And then we have our annual Youth Development Masters Institute here in Phoenix, May 3rd through the 9th. If you've never had a chance to come, you really ought to come. It's innovative, it's enlightening, it's energizing, you'll walk away wanting to come back every year. So um, I highly encourage you to think about participating in each and all of those if you have a chance. Uh, if you do want to contact me, my email is wendy at kidsathope.org uh, or you can log on if there are questions or concerns you have or you want to uh, sign up for any of those events that are upcoming, kidsathope.org is our website. And um, there is another uh, website available there, the Sanford School uh, Center for the Advanced Study and Practice of Hope that uh, we are also a part of. So we look forward to hearing from each and all of you. And I hope you have a great rest of your webinar Wednesday. See you all soon.